Okay, you guys. So you know how people tell you to play it cool around people that you look up to and really admire? Um, I have no cool right now. I, Marcus, this is my redemption interview. And let me tell you why. I was in an elevator with you at Social Media Marketing World back in 2013, 2014. I don't, 2014 probably. And see, like a million years ago, and you would have thought George Clooney was in the elevator with me. I think you were the keynote that year. You were one of the big presenters, and I was such a fan of yours already. This is almost a decade ago. And I froze. I was like, dude, you're in the elevator with Marcus Sheridan. Say something cool. Say something like, oh, huge fan. (laughs) And I was just... That's silent great. and frozen and got off the elevator and texted my now husband. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was so excited. So I know this is a story that none of our listeners care about, but I just have to let you know, I have been a huge fan for a very long time and we are so happy to have you on the show. Well, thank you. That's, um, that's funny. I mean, yeah. right? it's like, right. My kids would be laughing at you right now, Carly. Like, trust me, my dad's a dork. Uh, so yeah, yeah. You missed the opportunity to talk to a dork that day in the elevator. So no, I'm, well, my kid I, would be like, I appreciate that though. She'd be like, that was no chill, mom. Like it's so awkward <laughs> that I kicked off the interview. So we will both have conversations with our kids after this, but let's get to what we really want to talk about today and what our listeners want to hear. So Joe, I know you have, you wanted to kick things off a bit, so go for it. Yeah. Well, I just, I've seen you speak at Inbound, I think every year since I'm, I think 2015. I'm not 100% sure about whether you've been there every year, but I, I have and and I've always been blown away. So I'm I'm going to be the uh, the question asker today because um, I've just uh, I've, I've got lots of them. So the first one is is if you had to pick one word to describe the secret to business success for anyone, particularly solopreneurs, because that's what our audience is, what would that one word be? I think today it's disruption. And uh, I, I find myself thinking about it a lot more, Joe, than ever before, because it's it's getting harder to get found and to get noticed and to be heard above the noise. And so um, I am now finding that what I'm using most to help companies just really do pretty extraordinary things within their space and to become incredibly known uh, and to build more trust is to disrupt their market. And there's very specific ways they can do that, of course, and we can talk about that. But um, inherently, most people don't want to disrupt. Uh, They just want to follow the rules they've always been given within a space, which I think is really sad and not very exciting, right? But if you're willing to do things differently, oh my goodness, like world, get out of your way because then you you can do things that people write about in history books. I'm serious about that. And and you know a lot of the things I did with my swimming pool company back in the day, I didn't really know they were incredibly disruptive. I mean, I knew that I was getting some complaints and people were saying things that were competitors and whatnot. But in hindsight, I'm like, whoa, that was really really disruptive. So when we say disruptive in the context of say solopreneurs, one person businesses. That could just be changing a business model around or speaking to something differently. Or, I mean, what, what kinds of things might, might they think of in the context? Let me give you of- some prompts. And anybody can follow this and you can use this to, uh, to really, again, it, to me, it comes back to getting known uh, and becoming more trusted. So, there's really four, I like to say, there's four pillars today of becoming that most known and trusted voice. Number one, you got to be willing to talk about what others in your space aren't willing to talk about. There's a lot of things. Uh, That hasn't really changed in many ways for over 10 years that I've been talking about it. We see uh, the big five and we can dive into the big five later, but you know, those five subjects that buyers want to know that buyers research that businesses tend to not talk about. So you can talk a lot about that. So you got to be willing to talk about what others in your space are not willing to talk about. When I say others, I'm talking about the majority. Number two, you got to be willing to show what others in your space are not willing to show specifically through video. And I still don't think anybody, like I shouldn't say anybody, most companies are not coming close to tapping into that. And number three, you've got to be willing to sell in a way that others in your space aren't willing to sell. Number four, you got to be more human than everyone in your space is willing to be. Okay, so you got 
What are you willing to talk about that others aren't willing to talk about? What are you willing to show that others aren't willing to show? How are you willing to sell in a way that others aren't willing to sell? And can you be more human than everyone else in a time when technology is really taking over? And so there's a lot of you know different uh, examples of that. But I think one of the easiest that you've heard me harping on, because I know and if you're listening to this right now in the audience, you're like, okay, I just want an example. Let me give you one of sell, show, and tell. I'll just combine all three of them. Uh, and that's self-service tools. I think self-service tools on your website are just, uh, they're going to be taking over I mean, across the board in the coming years. And self-service derives from this this reality that uh, they've done some studies, Gartner did one that says 75% of all buyers say they would prefer to have a seller-free sales experience. And so what that means is we don't hate salespeople. We just don't want to really talk to them until we feel good and ready. And so if you're listening to this right now, your potential customers generally don't want to talk to you until they feel like, okay, I'm not going to make a mistake. I'm informed and uh, I can do this. And so how do you do that? Or how do you help them get to that point? Self-service. So self-service manifests in different ways on your website, but one could be a self-pricing tool where you give them the ability to get a general price range or an estimate for that particular service or product that you offer. Um, That's one major one. Almost nobody's doing that in your space. So an example of talking about showing and selling, that really changes the sales dynamic because people come to you and they say, hey, I did that tool on your website and I already have a pretty decent sense as to what I'm going to spend. So dramatically more qualified. And for a lot of people, they don't reach out to a company, not because they're not interested. It's because they're too embarrassed to ask roughly, how much is this going to cost me? And so they don't even know if they're in the game. But once they know they're in the game, it's pretty incredible. So we can talk a lot about that. I've developed a tool for uh, pricing estimators. Let me give you another one. Um, Another one would be a self-assessment. A self-assessment is a tool that gives somebody essentially a score or a grade that says where they are in the process, right? So an example would be, let's say that you're, you know, you're thinking about working with a business coach. You're like, should I work with a business coach or not? Well, you could set up a really cool um, uh, experience on your website where somebody would come in, they would see that, like that clear question. Do I really or should I really be working with a business coach, let's say? And then they can, through a series, an interactive series of questions, they will give their answers. And then there's some type of output, which is the score. Best tool I've seen for that is called Score App. My friends. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like Daniel Priestley developed that tool. It's just a great tool, great for solopreneurs. It's very inexpensive. And so between that Score App and Price Guide, which is my tool that, that gives the price estimations, that's two, two great examples of talking about showing selling what others in your space aren't willing to do. And the, the neat thing about that is the more interactive or the more engagement they have with your business, the more the sunk costs increase. And as the sunk costs increase, they actually want to work with you more. And so it's it's quite fascinating, right? It's just a beautiful how it works. And so if they do a tool like that on your website, they feel like they were part of the design. They were part of the decision. You didn't tell them. You didn't force them. You didn't convince them. They did it on their own. And so therefore now they're reaching out, but they're much more prepared. Yeah, it makes it makes so much sense. I, I'm glad you mentioned Score App because I've looked at all of them and that is definitely the best tool for producing you know, good. You know, you can pr- produce a nice experience at getting the questions uh, answered, but also uh, just a great product at the end. You know, a report instead of just like a you know something on a screen. You can email them a PDF, yeah, a gorgeous PDF. And yeah, that, explains the that, why. You know, like yeah, it, it, uh, when you do these things, you have to be willing to show both sides of the coin. I call it the law of the coin, which is whenever you're trying to help someone make a decision. You have to show both sides of the coin, even if one of the sides of the coin works against you and against you making the sale. Because in the process of being willing to show both sides of the coin, you actually significantly elevate your trust, which is a really big part of this, right? So it's like, you know, if you've got this uh, interactive quiz that is, you know, should I be working with a business coach? Well, if a good portion of the results don't equate to the person being told, Hey, based on what you've just put in, this is not the best time for you to work with a business coach. Well, you're not doing it right. 
so different than if you go to my swimming pool website, riverpoolsandspas.com, I've got a tool that helps you figure out, should I go with a concrete pool, a vinyl liner pool, or a fiberglass pool? And we literally, every single day, we recommend to many, many people from that tool, don't buy fiberglass, which is crazy that's what because you that's all we sell yeah. is fiberglass, right? But that's the way that you have to think if you want to become a disruptor, if you want to do what others aren't doing. And that's how we have become such a known and trusted brand. Question for you, just because it's 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 a real battle with a lot of solopreneurs, this concept of putting your pricing on, on a pricing estimate or your pricing on the site. And there's so many people that say, no, 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 I, I, I need to talk to them first or they'll be scared away by the price. And then you said something which I think is so true. I'm not going to reach out because I don't want to be that guy that goes into the restaurant, sits down at the table, looks at the menu and has to leave. You know, you just feel really dumb. And I, I just can't not convince some people that this is a good idea. Well, that's because people aren't always self-aware. If you look at the way you behave today, the way you shop, the way you buy, it gets pretty easy to say, geez, I should probably treat my customers that way. It's, it's the golden rule, right? And so if you believe in the golden rule, and if you say, I really do want to treat my customers as I would want to be treated in the sales process, or I want to give to them what I would want to see when I'm on a website, well, then all of a sudden it gets a lot easier. And the other component to the, let's just say the pricing uh, thing, what scares us away from, from a price isn't the price. What scares us away foremost is when we can't find pricing. So ignorance online is the ultimate showstopper. You talk about one thing that will prevent you from reaching out to a company, one thing that will prevent you from moving forward is ignorance, not knowing the answer you're looking for. That stops you. Boom. But I mean, there's a lot of other reasons. There's a lot of other justifications to this. People forget when it comes to pricing, what's key is that you explain value. What does value look like? Why are some companies expensive? Why are some companies cheap? Every single person that's listening to this should have some type of pricing page on their site that explains what drives cost up in their industry, what drives cost down, why some consultants or advisors or businesses or whomever it is are expensive, why some are so cheap. That sets the stage for value. And then you can come in and say, and here's where I fall as a business. Here's roughly where most of my customers are. And you don't have to, you know, I'm not saying give an hourly rate. For the love of all that's pure and holy, don't give an hourly rate. What I'm saying is, unless you give them a sense for what to expect, most are going to be put off and they're not going to reach out. Or you can start to use really small, smart tools like Price Guide and Score App and get way more leads. And if you get more leads, that means you have a better database. If you have a better database, you can remarket. If you can remarket, you can nurture. If you can nurture, you can build enough relationships to start having a lot more conversations. And anybody that's listening to this, I guarantee it, 99.9%, they would say, you know, if I can just get in front of the customer, I'm really good then, and I will usually win the business. So the problem is always marketing and the brand, of course, right? Branding and marketing, that masks so many problems. But you see folks all the time, like, like I see folks all the time saying, you know, I don't get it. I just talk to them and I can win the business, but yet they're going out of business. Why? Because they're not doing this and they can't figure out how do I stand out? Well, you got to disrupt. You got to do things differently. And so I'm trying to help companies do things differently by giving buyers exactly what they want. Okay. Excellent. So we've kind of alluded to it, but um, a lot of solopreneurs may be hearing about your your book and your and your kind of your idea, your concept, your uh, they ask, you answer, right? So that is something that you've been talking about since I, I don't know exactly, but for many years now. And uh, can you just give me the elevator pitch for that? How would we lay that out for solopreneurs in a in a you know thirty second elevator ride um, to to use they ask you answer? I think you've started um, and explained it already, but if you could just kind of capsul- encapsulate it one more time, just to make sure we get this across to them. Yeah, buyers are more informed than they've ever been. They're vetting you at an unbelievable level. We know that the typical buyer is 80% through that journey before they reach out to a company. They want to be fed. They want to be satiated. 
They want to find someone they trust before they reach out. So in order to satiate them, you've got to be willing to address all of their questions, worries, fears, issues, concerns. And if you do that and they feel like I've learned everything from you, you become that known and trusted brand. That's what you're trying to do. And the process of doing that is they ask, you answer. Now, the one thing, the caveat to that, Joe, and and it's just people have to understand this. Sometimes they hear the title and they're like, well, I can't answer every question. Well, that may be true, but you can address every question. Perfect title really for the strategy is they ask, you address it as well as you possibly can. But that's not a good title for a book. (laughs) And so it's, they ask, you answer, right? Yeah. But it's really the mindset needs to be, they ask, you is, you address it as well as you possibly c- can. So let's say somebody came to me that was a financial advisor. Financial advisor says, you know, I've got all these compliance issues, Marcus. I can't really talk about that. Sure you can. You just can't give an exact answer. But you can address the question, the fear, the worry, the concern. And the other thing about it is you can't just address the ones that you want to talk about. You got to address the ones that they want to know. That's, it's they ask. Now, it's not just what they're asking though. It's what they're searching. It's what they're feeling. It's what they're wanting. So they're asking for some type of price range. Well, give it to them with the dang tool. They're asking to figure out is, am I right for this? Well, give it to them with the tool like score. So you see what I'm saying? It's like, that's what it is. It's like really being so obsessed with the way they think that you're willing to meet them where they are, not force some square peg into a round hole. Yeah. And Marcus, this is so refreshing because I think so many solopreneurs focus on the tactics and the technology and everything. And they ask you answer, this will, this can work no matter what AI comes up, no matter what changes happen in the marketing world. Like I feel like um, a, a person I used to work with, John Jans, who I think you know as well, he always had the strategy first approach. And I think this is just so relevant for people that they ask you answer approach this will stand the test of time. Like be transparent and the tactics can like follow based if they keep this in their mind. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So like what, what stands the test of time? Well, if I went to anybody and I said, is trust going to be fundamental to your business in 20 years? What would you say? hundred percent are going to say yes, absolutely. No question. If I said, is Google going to be fundamental to your business in 20 years? The correct answer is I have no idea. Because none of us know, and there's a very decent chance that it won't really be around in 20 years, or it's going to look so dramatically different, right? And so that's because platforms come and go. But what doesn't is principles. Every single business, regardless of how unique you think you are, is in a battle for trust every single day. So if you can become that most trusted voice, you're built to last. Well, one of the things that we know is going to be true is that forever, people are going to have questions, worries, issues, concerns. So they're going to go somewhere where someone is willing to address those things. Now, somebody might say, well, what happens though if AI is the one that they're getting all the answers from? Well, here's what you're going to find. That AI is just one means whereby people are going to get their answers, their recommendations. Uh, There's going to be a certain percentage that are going to use traditional search engines, but that's going to be less and less over time. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to be using YouTube in the coming years. A lot of people that are going to be using social media in the coming years. Every single piece of content you put out to the world is like a signal. And the battle we're in today in conjunction with trust is a battle of signals. And so there's two major parties that are waiting on your signals. First party, of course, is the potential customer. And so you need to have all these signals out there that says to that person, that individual, that entity, hey, this is someone I want to work with. But you're also sending out signals to AI. So every piece of content you produce, your AI looks at that and literally they're saying, okay, when I'm giving recommendations, this is a company that I want to recommend. And so it's like the companies that have been doing the Ask You Answer, they're doing much better in terms of being recommended by AI than the companies that have not. I mean, we've tested this. And it's because of these signals that are so strong coming from the companies that said, hey, we're going to be the best teachers in the world. We're not going to ignore these questions. We're going to address it really prolifically through text and video on our website, online, on social, et cetera. And so that's why it's so built to last, Carly, because it comes back to that fundamental uh, foundational building block, which is trust. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, 
you know, it makes so much sense that um, AI is all about answering questions. So if you're answering questions and teaching AI to answer those questions, you're probably going to wind up in a better position with AI. It's, oh, it's 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 true. I mean, I've we've seen the data now. I mean, it's it's absolutely true. And you know, it's it's interesting too because you know AI sources stuff and. It's, you know, certain platforms show those sources and you want to be the one that is being sourced. And so there's all these reasons for it. Sometimes people say, well, I just I'm not going to produce the content because I'm not going to get found on Google because AI is changing all of that. I'm like, that is so nearsighted. I mean, really? That's the only reason why you're producing content before? Come on now. Get your head out of the sand. There's a hundred other reasons to be doing this. And besides, it's just really, really healthy. You know, like you guys know that I post on LinkedIn four or five days a week. I put my best stuff there, my thoughts there. I'm, I do it for a few different reasons, but the biggest reason is it forces me to take what's in my head. I just got to find it and articulate it in a way that really makes sense to the rest of the world. And by using that as a testing ground, I'm able to say, okay, this content resonates, this doesn't resonate, this works, you know, there's a path here. There's something here. I got something. And then I can take it to the stage and then I can teach it to companies, you know, and vice versa. This is how it works. Right. And so there's so much value in content in the process of producing and writing the gospel according to you. Like, what is your gospel? What is your doctrine? Very, very powerful when you do that. And it only continues to benefit me every single day. Awesome. Yeah. Um, that makes so much sense. You know, you start, you start on the, the video on, on uh, social media and then refine it into your speeches. And yeah, I love it. So we're talking here effectively about transparency. I mean, a lot of this is really transparency. Is that fair? It's very fair. Uh, and by the way, most companies say they're transparent and they're not, Joe. Uh, right. It's, it's a totally overused word, misunderstood. And that's what my question is. So what are the misconceptions about transparency versus what it really is? Let me give you an example. Yesterday, I was speaking to a $1 billion company. I mean, this is a very large organization, uh, business units all over the world, and they brought their leadership team in, and I was speaking with them. And I taught them uh, about self-assessment tools, uh, and not just self-assessment tools, but it was self-service tools in general. And after I was, I, I was done with uh, self-service as a topic, I looked at one of the core business leaders uh, who leads one of their companies because they have a bunch of companies in their umbrella. And I said, on a scale of one to 10, how well are you doing self-service on your company website right now? He said, we're a five. I said, okay, good. I said, how many of those self-service tools that I just showed to all of you, how many of those do you have on your website right now? He said, well, well, actually, we don't have any of those tools, but we do talk about some of that stuff. I said, whoa, you, sir, are not a five. You're a zero. You don't get it. And you're not being honest with yourself right now. And by the way, that is how I talk to people because that's what they pay me to do. All right, be honest with them. And so he said, yes, yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess we're not doing that at all. Just because you're talking about some things on a website doesn't mean that you're creating an interactive experience where this person develops a relationship with the buyer's journey and with you because they're more involved with it, right? It's like they're, it's their creation. It's a totally different game. And so I see this all the time with companies. I'll say, are you doing that? They'll say, yeah, we're doing that pretty well. And then I'll ask one or two follow-up questions and they always end up saying, yeah, I guess we're not doing that at all. And so this is what I mean by transparency. Someone says, I'm transparent, really. So how much do you really explain cost and price of your product and service on your website? Eh, we don't do that. Do you have a pricing estimator on your website? No, okay, uh, you're not transparent. Don't lie to yourself. Um, how much uh, do you talk about who your product or service is for and who it's not a good fit for? Are you explicitly stating who your product or service is not a good fit for on your website? Uh, we only say who it's for. Uh, not transparent. Sorry. Right. So it just goes on and on. I could just go. To, 
I could literally spend an hour giving you example after example after example of how companies say they're transparent, but when push comes to shove, they're not. And why? Because they're still living in 1995, which is right at the end of the non-internet era. End, by the way, the year I graduated high school. Excellent year, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, you produce a, a lot of content. Uh, I see your posts every day. They're, they're, you know, a lot of them are video. Um, you, you, you put some time into it and you're busy. You're all over the place speaking. Most of the solopreneurs we work with are very busy. You know, it's a, you're doing a lot of things yourself. How do you prioritize your content creation and, and, and make sure that you're putting time into it? and still keep doing what you have to do to run the business. Yeah, I don't think I have this mastered very well, but I I do take it very seriously. I'm pretty religious about it um, because I know that it's very, very easy to fall into this trap of, I mean, I just don't really have anything to say today, so I'm not going to post. That basically means I'm, I'm too lazy to think today and to grow. And I fall into that trap. I mean, I'm going to be honest. But I need to work out what's in my head. And I need to... It's like, how did I become a full-time speaker now for, I don't know, 13 years roughly I've been speaking full-time? Most speakers don't make it past five or six years and they're just flaming out. Because the thing that they were talking about has just like passed them by. So I'm 13 years in. I got another like 30 left. I'm sure of it. I mean, I'm going to be doing this for 30 more years. So why is that? Because I am incredibly intentional about looking around me for content opportunities. I see content opportunities in everything. And I think part of it is because I am a storyteller. I understand the power of storytelling. I'm very good in advance with how to tell story. I'm just looking for it. And I'll have things happen to me, Joe, that like anybody else would go through in their they wouldn't, they wouldn't even think about it. Whereas I have the event happen to me and I'm like, ooh, that, that could be a great story. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to integrate that into, you know, into something because if, if I can take that and, and show it to the world, it'll stick, it'll land. And so it's crazy the difference. You take a, a platform like LinkedIn of sharing a story versus just sharing, a, let's say, a principle, uh, a teaching nine day the stories crush it every time well, on the storytelling front so you are you an innate storyteller or did you become one because of how crazy your success story was i mean your pool company story is so well known throughout the marketing world and beyond and it was a huge success story did your storytelling come storytelling come from that and did you have to work at it or are you just a naturally born storyteller? And what advice do you have for people that struggle with that aspect? Well, I, uh, the, the, the easier answer would be to say, yeah, I've really worked on it. That might be slightly true. That, that, I mean, it is true in that I've obsessed about communication for a long time. But when I was a kid, I remember... I was one time, I think I was in fifth grade, and um, this kid next to me in class was named Mac. And Mac was struggling with a, a math problem. A teacher was explaining to him how to solve it. And I remember looking at Mac, and I was looking at the teacher, and I could see Mac's face, and Mac clearly wasn't understanding the thing. It just wasn't registering. Teacher just went on and on. Finally, the teacher says, so you, you know, do you, do you got it, Mac? And Mac was like, uh, yeah, I think so. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm just sitting there like, does anybody else, is anybody else watching this? Mac doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. Hello, teacher. Hello. He doesn't get it. And from an early age, I seem to understand there was a very big difference between clean, effective communication and communication that was not. Communication that was not clearly understood. And so part of that was that early on, I noticed I could tell stories better than other people. In fact, I mean, 
I can tell, usually I can tell people's stories better than they can tell them their, themselves, right? But it, there's a, just, there's, there, is there nuance to it? Yes. But uh, the, the thing that I oftentimes will tell people, because occasionally I'll work with someone and mentor someone, especially if they're, if they're trying to become a better speaker or better, you know, presenter, whether it's a leader, speaker, whatever. Let me say, I can't see what you're saying right now. And if I can't see what you're saying, then it doesn't have legs. It just doesn't work. It doesn't resonate. And so that's the mistake that a lot of people make. They naturally assume that you can see what they can see. But, you know, even when I just told you that story about Mac, you could see me sitting there. You could see Mac a little bit. You could see the confusion on his face. You could see the teacher which wasn't getting it, right? It was a really quick story. You know, there's like, I see the world in the form of a story, which is why like you take a good interview. Uh, every single question you ask, if I'm good at my job, I have a story for it. And it's a question like, how many of these stories do I want to tell? Because they each take a little bit of time. But literally every single question you ask me today, I've got at least three to probably seven stories that are just ready to roll at any point in time. So I'm going to communicate in stories. If I communicate in stories, a lot of this is really going to land. It's, it's going to you know resonate with the audience. If I'm speaking in platitudes, theories, whatnot, it's just not going to work as well. There's a lot of things, though, that, that we can do on that, Carly. But I just think it's got to be, we've just got to become more obsessive when we tell stories about could the person truly see this like I see it right now. So, Marcus, we have a lot of people that listen to this podcast don't sell a physical product. They have some kind of intellectual property or or innate ability. They're they're coaches. They're they might be consultants. Um, and, and much like you with your speaking, right? I mean, you're not really giving people anything other than your knowledge and insights. And as you put out content and answer questions, how do you thread the needle between, you know, doing enough to to build trust and be helpful and not giving away the farm so you don't have anything left to sell? I actually don't believe you can uh, ever give away too much of the farm. I, I just don't, I just haven't found that to be the case. You know, uh, I, I love the story of uh, the Geek Squad. I don't know if you've heard the Geek Squad, but, you know, they, they fix computers and they're a big company uh, around the US, UK. And uh, they, they, they actually do a great job creating content that teaches people how to fix their computer problems. And one time somebody went to the CEO and said, uh, you know, you're, you're producing all this content. Doesn't that somewhat, you know, cut your nose despite your face situation here? And he said, don't you realize the number one person, my number one customer is the person that tries to do it themselves. And this is how it works in every single industry. A lot of it comes down to the difference between a scarce, a scarcity mindset and an abundance mentality, right? So I remember I started uh, creating uh, all different types of videos for pools that nobody had ever created, disrupting the industry. One of them was was uh, service videos. So we created a bunch of videos on how to winterize your pool. And I had people saying to me, "Yeah, but if you show them how to winterize their pool, well, then they're not gonna they're not gonna like need you because they're gonna do it themselves." I'm like, first of all, people aren't dumb. The internet eliminated that. I mean. They're going to become informed if they want to become informed. Then they're going to get the answer from somebody. And so I want to make sure they get it from me. Second of all, let's say they went to you know seven websites and they know they want one of these companies to service or winterize their in-ground swimming pool. Which one are they going to use? The six that don't show them how or the seventh that actually does show them how? They're going to use the one that showed them how, right? There's a reason why some of the most successful chefs in the world all have cookbooks, recipes, they put it out there. I mean, it's just like, they just put it out. They said they make a lot of money and, and they're not worried. Oh, gee, you're not going to see this recipe. And so, you know, so often we think we have, you know, this like secret sauce when in reality, it's only Thousand Island dressing and everybody knows it. It's just that you have to understand that, okay, they're going to get the information. So they might as well, again, they might as well get it from you. And that's the mindset uh, that's the mindset that I have, and it's it's done me really really well. And it's you know all the companies, you know I've got this, uh, I've got they ask you answer, 
I've got an entire coaching company that does millions of dollars in revenue a year. And all it does, it teaches companies how to apply. They ask you answer. But guess what? Everything that I'm going to show them is already in the book. So it's, it's not, it's, there's, there's no secret sauce. I tell customers sometimes, I'm literally going to do for you that which you already know you should be doing. You're just not doing it. And I'm going to be your accountability partner now. So it's like, this is, this is what coaches, this is what advisors do, right? This is what solopreneurs do. So I think if you own that, it becomes a different game. And also, when you really put it out there, then you can monetize your intellectual property in diverse ways and really start to build multiple revenue streams. And to me, that's a lot of fun. I mean, I really enjoy that. I love it. That was such a great answer. That was I pe- one that I think a lot of people need to hear. So thank you. Um, so competitors, you, you talk about competitors in your pool company, and you said that they've sometimes been upset about it. So what is what is the strategy for talking about competitors without, um, I don't know how to say it exactly, without being the bad guy? Yeah, without poo-pooing your competitors. <laughs> I mean, what? the- the the thing the thing about this is is if you go back to they ask you answer are you being asked about your competitors is your sales team or you being asked you know if you're with me is there anybody else you might choose the answer is eh, probably so probably yes almost every time and so if that's the case what this means is we don't ignore it we address it and we address it head on. And so there's many different ways that you can do this. But one thing I don't suggest you do is you shouldn't talk negative about your competitors. Uh, there's no reason to do that. And it's just going to invite negative energy. But you can factually state the differences. And, you know, we've done this. I remember one time, this was back when I was still a pool guy, right at the end. I mean, this is probably 14 years ago or something. I was sitting in Richmond, Virginia with this couple for like two hours and I gave them a quote for a pool. And at the end of this, giving them a quote, they looked at me and they said, Marcus, we like you. We think we want to do business with you. But if we don't do business with you, is there anybody else in the area you might recommend? And I thought, oh, geez, I hate this question, Joe, because it meant they weren't going to buy and they didn't buy that night. But I had a long drive home and I thought, well, they asked the question, which means I need to answer it. So I went home that night and I wrote an article and published it on our website. And the title was, Who are the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia? Review slash ratings. And I came up with a list of five of the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia. What's crazy is I didn't even put myself on the list of five because I didn't want it to sound self-serving. And what was the result of that? Well, because we can track the revenue that we've made from different pages of the website, that article over the next year made us a quarter of a million dollars in sales. And some people say, yeah, but aren't you afraid you've now introduced them to the competition? Once again, I just don't think buyers are stupid. I think they got this thing called the internet. They're going to get the answer. And so there's really no secrets out there. So I might as well just give it to them because they're going to get it anyway. And now, though, because of that article and so many others like it and videos like it, you know, we rank for a ton of our competitors' keyword phrases, you know, reviews, such and such company, Richmond, Virginia. I mean, we just slay like that because that's disruption 101, Joe. That's what it's all about. And you look so confident and trustworthy by doing that, right? I mean, they look and go, well, obviously, they're not afraid to mention the competition. They must be good. You know, they wouldn't be here. That's exactly right. That's that's the thing. And they're like, if this dude has the audacity to talk about this, they've got to have something special about them. And so, you know, I, I mean, I've just just done so many things like this. I mean, I could literally go on and on. You know, I would just if you're listening to this right now, it's like, have you really done anything truly different that you're known for in your space? Um, let me let me give you another uh, example, and this might not directly apply to a solopreneur, but it's still I think it's a great example because it just happened to me yesterday. So yesterday I'm speaking to this uh, company that makes labels, and they do it all over the world. And I asked them, I said, uh, are, is there a different stickiness level of labels? Like are some more sticky than others? They said, well, yes, 
As, as a matter of fact, I said, is there a standard of stickiness for labels that the world follows? They said, there's, there's no standard. I said, could you come up with the standard? They said, yes, we could. And I said, and if you come up with the standard for stickiness, which that standard then gets used to help people understand what type of label should be used on what type of product. If you do that and you start using this often, now all of a sudden, all the people that are buying from you or that could buy from you start to look for this standard when they're making choices with their products to put labels on them. And as they do that, now they're asking their vendor, their supplier, hey, what's the rating for this for the stickiness level of this label? And suddenly you've now become the known entity that did that thing. And this was just a simple example. This is a huge company. They've never thought of this. If they do this, it's going to drive a massive stake in the ground. That's how you create IP. And so if you're listening to this right now, there's probably all types of ways that you could drive your stake in the ground and say, you know, here's how the industry should be. Here's what's wrong with the industry. Here's something that's outdated with the industry. You got to be willing, though, to speak up on these things. That's how you get people's attention, man. And then suddenly they're like, oh, man, finally somebody's willing to talk about this. I've been thinking this for a while. And now they reach out to you. And again, I know I've been redundant, but you become that known and trusted brand. No, the Absolutely true. And you know, honestly, you're, you're making me think a little bit about what we're doing here because we are we are definitely in disagreement with a lot of the industry that's out helping solopreneurs because it's, you know, to us, why would you be a solopreneur and give up the most powerful scaling tool available, which is employees, to, to scale? It's crazy, right? So people are doing it to, to live life on their own terms. And yet there's a lot of people out there talking about how to scale and get to seven figures as a solopreneur. Sure, it can be done, but it's not really what people are about. So I, yeah, thank you. I'm going to be, I'm going to be harping on that a lot more now. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I just continue to ask people, brands, what are you known for? And I think this is going to become more and more relevant, Joe. I mean, it's always been relevant, but it's going to become really relevant because of AI. This idea of having a known brand, it's just... We just can't even fathom how important that's going to be in the coming years when the whole world is different in terms of the way people shop and buy. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you and I have chatted about this online, you know, it's it, nobody knows what's what's happening. Nobody knows where it's going exactly. But one thing is for sure is it's going someplace different than where we are now. So, you know, I don't want to keep going, keep you going too long here. I know we have, uh, you know, time constraints. So let me ask you just a couple more questions. Um, one is um, customer testimonials, social proof, case studies, those kinds of things. Um, do you have any particular uh, recommendations or advice for how to use those to build credibility and trust? Well, I still think they're a really big deal. Um, Google My Business is a very, very big deal for uh, geocentric uh, companies. you know. And I would just say this, you know, having... Uh, been in a lot of industries this year and, and a lot of businesses that were location-based, I will say this. Um, the ones that do the best when it comes to social proof, reviews, etc., have an intentional program whereby they gather these reviews. They gather the testimonials. They don't do it by chance and happenstance. It is part of their entire, let's call it customer journey. And so if you're listening to this and it's not integrated into your entire sales process and customer journey, it needs to be because it's that important. And again, every single review, every testimonial, every star, that's a signal that's sending to the world into AI, hey, they need to pay attention to you. Very good. And we ask this of every guest on this, on this podcast, um, what is your favorite quote about success? Um, it would be from Jim Rohn, who's my, uh, one of my greatest mentors by far. And I could give 27 of his quotes right out the gate, but the one that he's maybe most f famous for, and I believe most is you have to learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. 
And once you learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job, really extraordinary things happen. Awesome. And lastly, if people want to learn more about you, um, your business and what you do, where can they find you? Well, make sure you connect with me on LinkedIn to say, yeah, hey, you know, I heard you on the One First Podcast and, uh, you know, enjoyed whatever or I hated it, Marcus, either way. Uh, connect with me there on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also find my uh, tool price guide at priceguide.ai. Uh, consider using that if you want to uh, generate a lot more leads. It definitely works. And uh, you can email me if you want. An easy email is marcus at marcusheridan.com. It's pretty easy. Well, Marcus, thank you so much. This was just totally awesome. And we are so excited to have had you on the podcast. And, um, and I just, uh, I will continue to follow you on LinkedIn and, and I, I check out your posts every day. They're always inspiring. So appreciate it very much. And listeners, uh, don't forget to subscribe. Give us that nice five-star review. Uh, check us out on YouTube. If you want to see uh, Marcus's animated uh, persona uh, in video. And, um, and, and uh, just uh, we'll see you next week on uh, The Aspiring Solopreneur. Thanks a lot.